All right. Looks like people are slowly coming in. Just wait for I guess the attendees to all come in. If you guys want to put in the chat box where you're all from, that would be great. So we can see everyone. All right, well, um, welcome, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it's great to virtually hopefully see you all here. We're seeing lots of people in New Zealand, Sweden, Finland, uh, Norway, Yorkshire, all over, lots of Londons, um, and Korea, Brazil, all over the world. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Chris uh, Martin, and I am the head of educator training at WSET. Um, and I will be with you for the next hour with my good friend and colleague, Vicky. Um, and we're gonna be talking about diploma, uh, tasting, and how the diploma works, and then looking at three different tasting um, notes. So um, as I say, I'm the head of educator training I'm here at WSET I'm at the school in London School. I teach um, all levels of diploma, uh, sorry, all levels of WSET and in diploma in particular, I teach about Central uh, Europe, fortified wines, um, as well as the wines of the United States. Vicky, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Vicky. I'm Head of Product Development for Wine Qualifications at WSET. Um, this basically mean, means I'm responsible for the textbooks, study guides, uh, SATs, um, things that basically end up in front of a student when you're studying a WSET wine course. Um, when I teach um, diploma, I generally teach sparkling wine and Spain. Um, and I became a Master of Wine in 2015. Excellent. Thank you very much, Vicky. All right. Well, let's get started here, everyone. So you should be able to see my screen. Um, and what I'm going to do is just walk you through very quickly an introduction to the diploma. Vicky will talk a little bit more about how it's structured. And then we'll get into the fun bit with the three tasting notes. Um, if you haven't got the three tasting notes, Jenny will post them. Uh, in the chat, I'm sure, um, but you should have those, those three tasting notes with, with some blanks that we'll fill in today. So what is the diploma? So the diploma is a 116 hours of classroom course um, that really prepares you to be sort of fully understanding about the production methods of um, still sparkling and fortified wines. And really the key with diploma is about learning analytical skills, uh, not only about tasting, but also about business, about production, and about the whole world of wine. After you complete the diploma, you will get the postnomials DIP WSET, which you can put after your name. And you'll also be able to join our global network of alumni, uh, where you can network and talk to marvelous people all around the world. So what is the, WS, uh, the WSET level four diploma and how does that fit into our suite of qualifications? So we have four sort of levels here. And I think majority of people on this call are probably at level three or thinking about doing level four, but it's important to think about how we go from level one, level two, level three to level four. And level one is very much just sort of collecting some facts. Level two is starting to understand how those facts relate to each other. Level three, we really start to then ask and, of students their ability to explain and apply those facts to different situations, asking how might a winemaker create a more concentrated style of wine or how might uh, the natural factors influence the style and quality of the resulting wine. And we do this at level three, as many of you will know, through the short written answers. As you go from level one to level two to level three to level four, it is about, to a certain extent, getting more knowledge, but it's not just about the accumulation of facts. It's also about the application of these facts. And level three is a prerequisite to go to 
um, level four. And at level four, we're very much focused on analyzing. Um, so here, it's not just about, for example, with Beaujolais, about understanding the different structure, the, the trade structure, how it's made, but it's also trying to put that within the global context. What are the strengths and the weaknesses of, of that particular category? What are the particular other styles of wines that might be competing with it? Where is it going to go in five years? And that's part of what you'll be learning at um, level four. So I'm going to hand over to Vicky, who's going to take us a little bit more into the, the, the detail of that. So, Vicky. Thanks, Chris. So um, the diploma is a course that um, most students do over around 18 months to two years. Um, as you can see here, it's made up of six different units, um, each of what each of which is, um, has its own separate assessment. Uh, we have two foundation units, which is uh, D1 and D2, and then um, a number of product knowledge units. Uh, the foundation units are those um, that are going to give you the real sort of principles um, of wine production, wine business, as you can see here. And then in diploma, you're expected to apply that knowledge um, for those product uh, knowledge units. A little bit like if you've um, done uh, level three in the last few years, and you've got the sort of uh, winemaking and growing environment chapters at the start of uh, your book and then start of the course, that you're applying those um, when you look at the sort of wines of the world later in that book or course. Um, so for the foundation units, um, these are based on, um, these are assessed by theory exams. It's a little bit like um, a sort of slightly harder version of the short written answer questions that you have at uh, level three. Uh, you can see here that D6 is an independent research assignment, so that's a piece of coursework. And for D3, D4 and D5, this is part tasting examination and part theory examination. And today we're going to focus on our tasting examination for uh, D3. D3 is really the sort of the biggest unit um, between the, uh, the tasting and the theory combined is 50% or 50% weighting of the course. So whereas the other units are like sort of little hills that you have to get over, the D3 is really the sort of mountain that you've got to climb to obtain the, um, the diploma. Um, so if we focus on tasting, um, D4 and D5, you've got uh, three wines in those exams, whereas D3, you've got 12 wines. Um, and those are generally put into um, flights, um, and we'll be focusing on one of those sort of flights uh, today in this webinar. Um, so while um, the tastings, um, in terms of time available, you've actually got 15 minutes per wine, roughly. So it's quite uh, similar to level three, but actually you're doing a lot more within that time at diploma. So whereas in level three, it's very much about sort of calibration and writing that accurate tasting note, in diploma, we're going a little bit further and we're focusing on uh, conclusions specifically. So Chris, next slide, please. Okay, so this will probably look quite familiar to you um, if you've done level three recently. Uh, quality assessment um, and um, what we call suitability for bottle aging. Um, so a little bit different in language to level three, but uh, very similar uh, constructs here. Um, but actually level four, as well as um, saying, okay, I think the wine is good or very good, um, you're expected to put an explanation down. So for quality assessment, there's actually six marks available in diploma. So a lot of that is about your reasoning for that quality. Um, similarly in bottle aging, that's worth three marks. Um, and again, at least two of those marks are available for your, for your reasoning. Um, we also have, as we talked about flights, there might be other questions to do with sort of identification of the wines in a particular flight. And you might be asked about sort of a common region, uh, a common country or grape variety. You might also be asked questions to comment on uh, the method of production um, or maybe the style of the wine as well. Um, and altogether, these sort of um, identifications or conclusions and these reasons um, make up around 40% of the marks. So as you can see, it's far more than the sort of standard tasting notes and we're going uh, much further into 
sort of uh, reasoning for the, the, for the diploma. Uh, next slide, Chris. So throughout um, the levels of WICT, really, um, you know, it is about describing an accurate tasting note, but it's also we want to go further and we want to really understand the wine um, that we're tasting. And in levels sort of two and three, that might be mainly done by your educator and they're sort of teaching you about the wine using the sample. However, when we get to diploma, while your educator will do that, you're also expected to be able to, to sort of showcase those skills when you're in, in the examination. So it's really taking the sort of evidence from the glass, uh, from your tasting notes, and thinking, what could this mean? And so applying your theoretical knowledge, um, applying your sort of experience of tasting over the years to make some um, conclusions and show your sort of understanding of the wine through those arguments. Cool, and on to Chris. Excellent, thank you very much, Vicky. Um, so what we're gonna do now, um, kind of after looking at that introduction, we're gonna look at the three tasting notes. I've been following in the chat. I think most of you seem to have got um, the three tasting notes. We will show them on the slide as well. Just as a note, if you do have any questions that you have for um, either me or Vicky, please put that into the Q&A so that we can answer it um, uh, when, when we have some time at the end. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at one of the questions that Vicky talked about, which was the common region. So wines one, two and three are all from a common region. And we're going to look then how to approach that. But first, we're going to look at how do we um, do quality, those two quality, uh, sorry, those two conclusions, um, quality conclusion and uh, suitability for bottle aging. So let's start here with tasting note one. I'm not going to go through it all, but I will say just a few things about the tasting notes that we've written here. Um, this is how you would write the tasting notes on the exam. So you don't need to write full sentences. You can just go bullet points. So long as you're describing the wine accurately is the most important thing. Um, the, the level four SAT is very similar to the level three SAT, which many of you are familiar with. There are a few differences, which you can note if you look at it. The one thing here for the red wines is that with tannins, we talk not only about the level, but also the nature of tannins. So we're just gonna leave this tasting note for a moment. And we're just, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about how do we approach the quality assessment of wine for level four. Now at level three, it is a little bit of almost a tick boxing exercise. And some of you will be familiar with what we call the BLIC. And I'm gonna go through, through that, but I want us to think here and make it a little bit more nuanced at diploma level. And that's what we're gonna be asking, or that's what the examiners are going to be asking you to do. Uh, and as Vicky said, it's not just about writing what the quality word is, it's also about writing an argument for why you think it is acceptable, good, very good, or outstanding. So let's just quickly go through here um, how we approach the assessment of quality. So the first one, B, as I mentioned, is for balance. And it's important when we're talking about balance that something is balancing something else. So this is why we have this picture here. You don't just want to say the wine is balanced. Saying the wine is balanced is a sort of nonsense statement, sort of saying the wine is wine. So when you're looking at the tasting note, you want to think about what are the things that are on the high end? What are the things that are on the low end? And, and what are the things that are balancing those particular um, structural elements? The L is for length. And in the assessment of quality, we don't just want to repeat necessarily the tasting notes um, that we had above it. We want to say a little bit more. And I always say, you, what you want to do is to tell us a story. Here we have someone reading a very exciting story. Um, so what's, what lingers on the palate? Um, does the, do the flavors evolve? Does it fall off quite quickly? Uh, this is a little bit what we want to talk about with the length. Intensity, um, think about here with intensity, how does the intensity on the nose, the intensity on the palate 
relate. Um, and so you can think about, you know, if the nose and the palate are more or less aligned, then the wine is promising something and delivering something. And then overall, we can say that the wine has this level of, of intensity. If the wine is um, sort of promising a lot, but then on the, on the palate, slightly under delivers, then we would sort of mark this down against the wine. Um, on the other hand, if the wine is sort of very muted on the, on the nose, but then on the palate is sort of an explosion of, of flavors, it's sort of under promised but over delivered. And this is a sign of high quality winemaking. So thinking about the intensity, it's not necessarily pronounced fantastic, light, negative. It's more about this interrelationship between the, pal uh, the nose and the palate as it kind of goes through um, the tasting here. The other thing with intensity is to also think about how well defined are the aromas. So are they quite generic, sort of like gummy candied cherries, or are they fresh, ripe cherries? And then the C in quality here is complexity. And we don't necessarily need to have oak for a wine to be complex. We don't necessarily need to have tertiary elements for the wine to be complex. We need to have sort of this, a number of clusters that are more or less well-defined that carry on from nose to palate and that give this, this complexity. And again, at level four, it's not either or. So it's not, it has balance, it doesn't have balance, or it has length, it doesn't have length. It's much more a scale. So we can use words like the wine high acidity is just in balance with the medium fruit intensity. Um, so this is where you, you, we, we, we have a bit more nuance and you as the a student and need to demonstrate your fluency with, um, with writing these tasting notes. So let's go through um, this tasting note, which I've written here um, for wine number one. Here, if we look at this, uh, let's, take, let's take it BLIC, and I'll show you then um, the answer. And as I say, the, we will give you at the end of this recording, all of our model answers. So you don't need to furiously take pictures or write down. We will give them to you. So here, if we look at our tasting note, we have high, ac uh, high acidity, we have high tannins, we have high alcohol. There's lots of high things there. So what's balancing those high structural elements? Well, in this case, we could say it's the pronounced flavor intensity. On the nose, we have pronounced flavors, uh, aromas, and on the palate, we have pronounced flavors. So the wine promises and delivers throughout. The, we, the length here is long. Now we haven't tasted, you can't, unfortunately, we couldn't send you all the wines. We would have loved to, but I think that might've broken our budget. Um, so you wouldn't, we won't know necessarily about here the finish, but we could say it's long and we might want to say a story and I'll show you what that looks like. And here we have nine different flavors uh, and aromas. And so the wine, it does have levels of complexity to it. So for this reason, this wine is outstanding. And here you can see the argument that we've written. Um, and you can see how we have with the finish, we said the finish is long, starting with ripe red fruits, then giving way to a slight dried fruit note. So notice how we've given it a little bit um, of, of a flavor and a story to this. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're going to make this a little bit, try to make this a bit of an interactive thing. There are quite a, there's 209 of you on, on, the, on the call today. Um, so we're gonna try as much as possible to, 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 to do this. Um, but I'm gonna hand over to Vicky, who will take us to wine number two. Thank you. Um, so yes, I think you've probably heard enough of uh, Chris and myself talking. So this is where it does get interactive. So, um, we're just going to give you sort of five to 10 seconds to look at um, the tasting note for wine two. Um, we're then going to launch a poll in terms of what quality level um, you think this wine would be. So just familiarise yourself with the notes. Think about everything that Chris has talked about in terms of balance, length, intensity, complexity, and think about is this wine completely positive? Is everything right with it? Are there some bits that might be uh, lacking? And shall we shall we launch the poll? Vicky? We shall launch the poll.
Okay, just a few more seconds to give your answers. Okay, could we have the results of the poll, please, Jenny? Okay, so most people are putting this in acceptable or good, okay? And I think by that, obviously, uh, we're seeing that, um, well, I don't think it was anyone that thought the wine was completely perfect and positive. Um, there were some sort of negative arguments there. And equally, I don't think many people were putting this in poor. So there was something positive about the wine. And so what we'd like you to do now is in the chat, rather than the Q&A, could you possibly put one uh, positive argument for this wine in the chat? So uh, that could be balance, if you think it's, uh, you know, balance that is the positive thing, or one of the positive things about this wine. It could be length, intensity, and it, try as much as possible to um, think about what Chris uh, said so if you're talking about balance can you can you provide us what was balanced in this wine using the note and think about uh, providing that story um, with the length obviously you've not got the wine in front of you but based on the note what do you think might be uh, found on the on the length for example Okay, we're seeing a lot coming in here. So it's great to see that um, on some of these balance notes in particular, we've got people um, saying uh, what is balanced in this wine. I think I saw a balance between acidity and that fresh uh, citrus notes, which is good. Shroot. Okay, balanced fruit and acidity. Okay, so a lot of people are picking out balance as one of the positive notes about this wine. Brilliant. Okay, and in a similar vein, um, because none, no one thought it was um, absolutely perfect either, could you tell me something that's uh, maybe lacking in this wine? Why was this wine not outstanding? Okay, we have simple aromas. Lacks complexity, lacks the length. Okay, a lot of people saying um, finish here. Okay. Brilliant, thank you everyone. So I think um, it seems like a lot of people have um, picked out the sort of main points here for why this wine um, sits where it does. So if we could go on to our note, Chris, that would be great. So we put this wine um, when we tasted it as good quality. Um, don't be sort of disheartened if you put acceptable quality for this. It's very hard when you actually haven't tasted the wine. And also diploma is very much about um, your arguments. So while there will be obviously right and wrong answers for some wines, it might sort of sit on the fence. And so it's all about how you argue and whether you can put forward an accurate and logical argument um, to sort of persuade the examiners that um, this wine is of this quality level. Obviously, I think if you put outstanding for this wine, the wine isn't outstanding, so um, you would lose marks there, but there still would be very good marks, if not 100% um, you know, um, marks for saying this could be acceptable as well if you'd argued this in the right way. Um, so just uh, a couple of seconds to look at our note on this, as you can see, uh, the sort of positive here and we've started with the positive um, factors about this wine and we have brought um, through that sort of balance that um, a lot of people picked up and in this case it's the fresh fruit um, uh, being balanced with the high acidity um, yes it was medium but it was medium on both the nose and the palate and so the concentration in this wine was exactly lacking um, so we've put that as a, a positive point in this case. Um, however, it is the sort of um, lack of complexity. Not very many clusters uh, were mentioned on this wine. And a lot of people brought up the fact that the finish um, was sort of lacking on this. And as you can see in our notes, we've put, we've described how um, the finish 
uh, ended. So we're saying that the simple notes sort of faded and then there was that lingering acidity, which isn't a particularly positive um, finish to the wine and hence we're marking it down. Cool, so shall we look at the next wine, Chris? Yes, let's go here. Um, and what, one thing I'll just add here, Vicky, as well, um, is that the way, as Vicky said, we've, she, we wrote it sort of positive then negative. So don't you don't always have to go balance length, intensity, complexity. There are other ways of, of looking at this. So let's go on to um, wine number three. And again, what we'll do is we'll give you just a moment to read through this red wine um, and just have a quick think about that. Uh, and then. So if you've got an idea now here of quality, um, Jenny, if you can open up poll number two, please. There we go. And we'll just give you a few moments to, to do that. And don't worry if you, if you just go for it. You're not in diploma yet, so this is all, all part of the fun. Uh, I'll just give you another five more seconds or so. Okay, let's uh, close the poll there, Jenny, and if we can see the results, please. Um, brilliant. So it looks like the majority of you, 73% were in very good. Um, we had some outstandings and we had some goods. And, um, you know, so we, no one put it in poor. That's great. Um, and again, as Vicky said, you, you haven't tasted the wine, um, uh, you know, but we've got this tasting note here. And this is where, you know, writing really good tasting notes helps you sort of think about, okay, how can we get to, to the quality level here? And at Diploma, it is about sort of going, all right, what might my arguments be? So, um, what I'm going to say before I show you our answer, we have gone very good for this wine. So that, that's great to see that so many of you also went there. Don't be disheartened if you didn't get um, very good. One of the important things here with, with very good is that if a wine is very good, it needs, you need to put in the argument reasons and justifications for why it is not outstanding. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is in the chat is to tell me why do you think this wine is not outstanding? So if you just have, just start writing in the chat and I'll sort of go here. Um, so we've got uh, so several people here talking about the finish. Um, looks like here, there's, yeah. So remember just even, if it doesn't have any tertiary, someone pop that in. That's not necessarily a sign of, of a negative. You can have you know, outstanding wines that are um, also uh, sort of primary only. Um, so it seems like the majority of you are going with finish as I'm just, things are flashing fast and furious on my screen. Um, and that's, that's actually what we, we've done here. Now, again, you haven't, you haven't tasted the wine. Um, but if we look at the next slide here, um, we've said that the wine is very good. Again, um, we've said the high acidity is balanced by the concentration of fruits. Um, we have complexity from the primary, secondary, and, and again here, we're not saying it's overly tertiary, we say hints of tertiary, in this case, uh, prune. Um, the intensity matches on the nose and the palate. However, the wine is not outstanding because on the finish, the fruit quickly fades away, leaving only alcohol. So we had that high alcohol with a medium finish. And when we tasted this wine, um, we thought that that finish wasn't quite um, enough to push it up to outstanding. So what we've looked at over the past sort of 15, 20 minutes is how to approach these quality assessments. Um, again, as I said, uh, we will give you all these answers so you can go home, or well, you're, you might be home already, um, and study them in any case. Uh, but what we want to do is sort of introduce what is expected of a student um, when they're taking these exams. And these questions, the quality assessment, will be asked of every single wine you taste um, across all, all the units. And it is always worth six points. And as Vicky said, this 
along with the suitability for aging, which we're going to get to in a moment, uh, makes it accounts for 40% of your tasting examination. And these are skills that you will build as you go through uh, the, the diploma. So now Vicky is going to take us to suitability for aging. Yes. So uh, if we could, yeah, perfect, Chris. Um, so as you can see with the uh, suitability for bottle aging, uh, very similar to what you see in level three, which is readiness for drinking, just slightly different language here. Um, you'll notice as well that there's only two options. Um, this is because um, in the examination, you're not going to get a wine that is going to be too young or past its best. So really we're focusing on uh, either suitable for bottle aging or not suitable for bottle aging. And what we mean by this um, in terms of suitability for bottle aging, uh, the focus is really, is this wine going to improve? Okay, is it going to get better with time? Um, and so if you think the wine could maybe hold or it might um, sort of evolve a bit, but it's not necessarily going to, to get better, or in fact, it's on a sort of downwards um, pathway, um, any of those would come into not suitable for bottle aging. Um, and as we've said before, um, this is about your sort of explanation. It's about your argument. So if you think the wine is sort of on the fence, or it could be either, this is where you can add your um, argument to show the examiners exactly what you mean. Okay, so we'll look at how you can um, make that argument now. So it's not the only way of structuring this argument, but probably good practice is um, because you've got sort of two marks for the, um, for the explanation part of uh, suitability for bottle aging is to first focus on what the sort of wine has or doesn't have um, that lends it into being sort of suitable for bottle aging. And then uh, spend your sort of next uh, mark or your next sentence uh, describing how will it change if it was to go through extra bottle aging. So um, in terms of the first point, uh, you might look at structure. So basically we're looking, is this wine in balance? Is there anything that is very much out of balance that would possibly get even worse um, with aging? Um, and linked to that, obviously there's a fruit concentration. So we know that sort of the primary fruit character will probably fade away. Therefore, if something's out of balance now, is that going to get um, potentially even worse um, with aging? Uh, in structure as well, there might be some components in the wine that uh, make it sort of suited to bottle aging. So typically um, like high acidity, um, typically sort of, uh, you know, either medium plus or uh, high tannins are sort of structural components that might make the wine more suited um, uh, to uh, bottle aging, uh, keeping it fresh and giving it structure uh, with that age. Um, equally, we would focus on fruit concentration. Is there enough uh, fruit? Is there enough primary character uh, for this wine uh, to age? And it's also about sort of taking your knowledge and making a best guess. So do you, is there any evidence? Do you think this wine would sort of develop um, in a positive way in terms of the flavors? Will the flavors become sort of interesting or would they just um, sort of fade away and you'd be left with um, you know, a lesser intensity there without anything more interesting perhaps happening? Um, and then we'll, we'd focus on how will it change? And that would be, uh, it could be a positive thing, it could gain more complexity from tertiary characteristics, or equally it could be a negative. The fruit could fade and this component of the wine might become out of balance or more apparent or something like that. Equally on how would it change, you might think about uh, things like oak integration. So would the oak um, become more integrated into the wine maybe, and that could be a positive, or would the tannins perhaps soften slightly and again, that might be a sort of positive for suitability for aging. Okay, so we'll look at our um, first wine. Okay, and based on this, we can see the overall, you know, there's a lot of highs here, 
but the wine is imbalanced. It, it does have pronounced flavor intensity as well to balance that sort of high acidity, high alcohol, high tannin. Um, we also talked about the components like acidity and tannin um, helping the wine to age. It's got high levels of both of those. Uh, it has pronounced flavor intensity um, and uh, still quite a lot of uh, primary character there. So again, it suggests that it might be able to age in terms of the flavor profile. Um, and there are some dried fruits. There's a little bit of leather there. So there is some evidence already on this wine that it might be sort of developing in an interesting way. So let's have a look at our note. Okay, so in this case, we put the wine as suitable for bottle aging. Um, and you can see the, um, the factors that I brought out already in the note. You can see the two sentences, one about the wine itself and what sort of structural components and flavors it has, and then how the wine uh, will develop with time. And again, you know, you could have um, argued that this wine was possibly maybe at its peak already. As we've said, it's hard without tasting the wine and having it in front of you. And you could have possibly said, oh, it's at its peak now. It might gain more tertiary character, but that's not necessarily a positive thing. It's, it's different, but it's not positive. And so you could have possibly argued in that vein if you thought that the wine was possibly going to hold, but not really get any better. And again, it's about using um, that argument to, um, to really show to the examiners that you understand uh, the wine in front of you. So I think we're going to look at wine two and open it up again, aren't we, Chris? That's right. Yes. So um, here we are, if you're following along, um, wine two, our friends. Um, what we're going to do this time is we're going to ask you what you think the suitability for bottle aging is. There's 50-50. Um, but then we're going to talk through it a little bit. So, um, Jenny, if you can open up poll number three, thank you very much. I'll just give you a moment there. Um, and while you're just filling that in, um, just to reiterate what Vicky said, this, whereas quality assessment is six points, uh, the suitability is three points. So you would get one point for what you're doing right now and then two points for the argument. I'll give you just about five more seconds. Brilliant. Um, Jenny, if you can close the poll and let's see what the results are from that. So the majority of you went not suitable for bottle aging, and that is the correct answer um, here. So thank you very much for, for going through that. So what I'm going to ask you to do um, in the chat here is to say why you think this won't age. What are some of the, the things, thinking about the arguments um, that, that uh, Vicky had talked about, what might be some of the, the arguments here? So if you just type that into the chat um, and we will we'll read it here. So we have, um, it's, it's simple, simple fruits. There's not enough flavor intensity. We've got the light body. Uh, remember, light body is not necessarily a, a reason why not it couldn't age. Lots of Rieslings are light bodied and can definitely age. Um, but I think we're picking up here on, on the fact that it lacks fruit intensity. Um, there's not enough fruit intensity. Exactly. Here we, we've got very simple um, fresh fruit flavors. Um, however, there is something positive to this wine. It does have high acidity. So if you're thinking about what um, Vicky was talking about with the, the structural elements and the fruit concentration, it has one of those, but not both of those. Um, excellent. So, and then, yeah, and then I think people here are saying what will happen to the wine, the food, the, the fresh fruit will just fade. Um, yeah, we've got simple um, and that's, that's absolutely right. So let me show you, thank you very much for all your wonderful comments there. Um, so this is the answer that we put in. Um, it's not suitable. And again, when you're, when you're learning and you're doing the diploma, you, it, it's helpful to have sort of some phrases um, at your fingertips to sort of help you understand the wine. And, and this is one of the ones, you know, despite having high levels of acidity, it lacks concentration of fruits um, on the palate, uh, and on the nose and on the palate. Um, and as, as many of you mentioned, with further age, the flavors will simply fade away. Excellent, so that's, that was that exciting wine number two. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Vicky, who will take us through wine number three. 
Okay, so we're going to do exactly the same um, with why number three. So just a couple of seconds to remind yourself of this why. Okay, and again, it's going to be 50-50 on our next poll. Okay, just a couple of seconds more. Okay, can we have a look at what the results suggest? Okay, so most people have gone with uh, suit suitable for bottle aging. Okay, so in this one, um, Chris, can we have our note? Great, so we did also go with um, suitable for bottle aging on this wine. Um, the wine does have high acidity and um, we said that uh, high acidity could be something that would help the wine to age. In this case, we think there's enough fruit concentration on the nose and palate to um, both to balance the high acidity and um, to ensure that it's got enough fruit concentration to develop further in the bottle. Um, and we thought in this case, the flavors would continue to evolve. There was already a little bit of dry fruit prune on this. Um, and in our note, we'd noted some of those sort of oak aromas as well. Um, and so we brought in the argument here that the oak would become more integrated. Obviously that's only something that you can tell when you're actually tasting uh, the wine, but um, in this case, we brought forward um, those arguments. I think maybe in this wine, uh, based on our sort of quality notes as well, there could have been an argument for saying not su suitable for bottle aging had you brought in the fact that there was sort of warming alcohol on the end, um, perhaps. Um, and so you could have said this is going to only become more noticeable um, with age, and that might have been a logical and accurate sort of way of arguing the other way, if you were one of those people who said um, it's not going to age. Um, so. so the next thing after um, we've covered up our sort of conclusions for each individual wine is to look at our um, sort of identification um, across the flight. And in this case, all the wines are coming from a common region. And so uh, on this slide, we've got a few um, sort of factors that you might want to um, consider when you're looking at sort of identify the common region questions. And not all of them will be sort of applicable in every circumstance. In some flights, um, some of these might be more sort of clear or more useful to you um, than others. So um, for example, we could look at grape varieties um, is there anything very sort of distinctive here? Is there a particular wine that stands out in terms of its sort of structural profile or its flavours that make you think, oh, I'm sure that that is this grape variety and therefore that leads me to a certain region? Um, it could be climate. Now, climate can be quite difficult. Um, it might be that you have um, high acidity throughout, you have kind of low to medium alcohols, you have um, just right flavours, and that might put you in, say, a cooler climate uh, region. So that could be uh, evidence in that sense. I think what we have here is some high acidities, but then we've got sort of some high alcohols as well and some kind of ripe flavours. So again, the evidence might not be quite so clear for climate in this particular flight. Um, wine making, um, again, there might be um, some particular techniques uh, that lead you to certain regions. So if you uh, sense sort of botrytis in the wine, for example, that might limit your options somewhat. Um, if you um, can detect sort of carbonic maceration, if you can detect sort of a dried fruit character um, that might come from a pasamento, again, those are all um, sort of evidence that might limit your options and make you think of a certain uh, or a wine from a certain region. Uh, styles of wine, um, again, the examiner is going to pick something that's fairly typical. So if you've got sort of three red wines in a flight, it's very unlikely that the region is going to be the Mosul. Um, so there might be some evidence there. You want um, the wines to um, sort of line up with what you would expect from that region. Again, some wines might be more useful others. If you've got a sweet wine in there, again, that's probably more limiting 
um, than just red and white wines. But equally, um, think what is typical. The examiners aren't going to put on something that's completely atypical of the region. Uh, quality levels, exactly the same. Um, think about what would be um, common uh, for the region. Um, in this case, for example, we had um, two red wines in the flight. Uh, they were very good and outstanding. So are we thinking of a wine that, um, you know, a, a region is, that is perhaps uh, noted for its high quality red wines? And uh, bottle aging, again, a factor that possibly isn't going to be your leading, um, leading evidence, but something that could be consistent as well. So, for example, in this slide, we had a wine that is potentially showing um, some degree of age and that could go on and age even further. So we're looking at a region where we think those sort of wines uh, might be produced. And equally, I think particularly for this flight, think about whether there's any... Um, great varieties there that really stand out uh, among the, uh, the tasting notes that we were given. Okay, so we're going to again open this up to a poll just for fun. Um, I can see people already putting um, little um, sort of suggestions in the, um, in the chat. But um, yeah, if you have like sort of five seconds to put your, your answers. Okay, and can we see the answers? Excellent. Okay, what do you think, Chris? Yeah, that's I'm I'm very impressed, um, Vicky. I think these are some some great great responses. Um, you know, don't worry, we will show you what they are. So don't you know if you've said it and it's incorrect, that's absolutely fine. This is part of what um, we're looking at with with the tasting. The tasting is very much about. Um, you know the ability to taste but it's also about the application of all the knowledge and that's kind of what Vicky was outlining here so um, if you had gone for the Loire um, we probably wouldn't have seen high alcohol such high alcohols um, on wine one and wine three in that in that region though wine two potentially we could have seen seen there um, Napa um, Napa is you know for for those of you who said Napa that's a, that's a good a good shout however for wines one and wine three, that kind of makes sense. However, with wine two, we wouldn't really have had such a simple, um, simple quality level wine, which we said was good. Um, in Napa, we would have expected sort of more high quality um, wines. Similarly, if you had put Stellenbosch, I think Stellenbosch is, is a good shout. Um, however, again, we might have thought that that wine number two was a sort of entry level Shannon. But it would have, and, and maybe we might have thought one of the others was a peanutage. Um, but that, that's kind of we're trying to shoehorn a bit of a bit of things in here. Um, Rioja, um, if you had thought that maybe the uh, <coughs> wine one was say a reserva or grand reserva, and wine three was uh, a um, maybe a criantha or a, or a reserva, I think that you're kind of in the right right direction there. However, again with wine number two. Rioja doesn't really make that sort of um, style of white wine. We would have expected it to be slightly lower, uh, more medium acidity, a bit um, maybe with a bit of a bit of oak. So here we have gone. Um, uh, uh, this is we haven't gone. It is uh, Piemonte, um, and this is the rationale. So thank you. Uh, then you can close that. Um, so we we can go here with um, our argument. This may look very scary <laughs> as an argument, but what uh, Vicky and I wanted to do was give you very much a model answer to what this what this looks like. Um, so here you can see that you and this would be worth 10 points overall. So you would get five points for correctly identifying Piemonte, um, but you would also get five points for your argument. So for those of you who put um, a different region, Though you wouldn't get five points for the right region, you could still pick up points for arguments that made sense. Um, so, for example, some of the things that I had said, you know, if you had thought it was a, a reserva Rioja or, or whatever, that kind of makes sense. And, and the, the examiners would give you some some points. But here we have 
Um, we're sort of going in right with, uh, as Vicky said, in wine number one, looking at the grape variety. And then we're thinking, okay, what, what else could the other ones be? Wine number three is indeed a Barbera. And what's wine number two? Well, this is, this is a Cortese. So we've gone in with that sort of, here we are. And those, where are those three grapes grown? Well, those three grapes grown are grown most famously in, in Pimonte. And then we're using quality um, to go from sort of where, where can they create from good um, to outstanding and then bottle aging there as well. So this would this would be a distinction level note that would get 10 points um, and that would be maybe on your way to, to the Vintners um, Cup. So we have about 10 more minutes now. Um, so what we what we will do is um, I've seen I've answered one or two questions. I was trying to do this multitasking here, um, but I think Vicky, there's some questions I think that that are, are there that I think you might might be best to answer. Um, and we'll try and go through all of these ones. If we can't get through all of these questions, um, please know that Vicky and I will will we will look at all the answers and um, we'll try and get them out uh, to the you in the post email, uh, post events email. Um, but Vicky, there was one question here um, about can we start the MW track with level three or is level four a prerequisite? As an MW, do you want to just answer that? Um, yes, yeah, so um, level four isn't um, a prerequisite uh, for the MW or for the Master Wine Study Programme. However, it is, sort of advised um, that you have um, level four. And what um, is a prerequisite is a sort of high level of, of study in wine. So if you didn't have the level four, but you had a say winemaking degree or a wine business degree or something again, um, or um, something on the sort of similar route um, that shows a high level of um, study in wine already, then those options um, would be suitable instead of level four. Um, however, um, I think probably level three um, alone um, would probably not be um, enough um, to, um, uh, to apply for the MW programme. Excellent, thanks. Um, and then we have another question here. Sorry, I, I thought I was in reading quests in order. Um, just with the exams, uh, Vicky, are they taking one, each module one after the other, or are they taken all at once? Can you just tell us a little bit quickly about how the exams work? Yes, so um, it would very, um, well, it would depend on your course provider, but you would study um, each unit sort of in turn, one after the other. So typically you would study a unit, take the exam, study the next unit, take the exam. There might be a little bit of overlap in that. There might be an occasion where um, possibly you take um, a couple of the sort of uh, smaller exams, maybe on one day or quite near to each other, but you, it wouldn't be a situation where you know, you have a whole week of these exams coming one after the other. So it is very much a sort of staged um, course where you're able to take an exam, get the, um, get the um, results for that and sort of uh, move on like that. Excellent. Um, then I'll just quickly go. There's a few questions here and I can quickly answer. It's easier to say it than to, to do this. Um, so we have a question here about um, it's no longer required to write out full and complete sentences. That's correct. You can just do bullet points. Um, and yes, we didn't go into how the marks are allocated, but you can read about that um, on, I think it's in the tasting guidance. Is that correct, Vicky, about how if, if for example, there is oak you need to mention oak in order to gain the full points um, for the wine. Is that correct? Um, so, uh, yes. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's about writing a complete um, sort of tasting note. So if there were sort of notable oak aromas, it would be expected that you would um, um, signal that in your tasting notes. Um, in terms of putting something like, um, is there more oak than primary? And that probably comes into more of a sort of quality note. So if you think the, over uh, the oak is overtaking the kind of primary flavors in a sort of negative way, that might be sort of part of your arguments for your quality assessment, but it might not necessarily um, need to be stated or it wouldn't need to be stated in your tasting note. That's very much about medium plus or pronounced um, intensity overall. 
Excellent. Um, and then we have a question here about typicity. Um, I can quickly go to that. We we don't bring in typicity um, in into quality arguments. Um, you know, you can talk about oh, this is this is a classic example of a Rioja, but if it's not a Rioja, you're going to look rather silly. So better just to stick to those um, that BLIC that we were talking about. Um, and then we have another question here about intensity. So if the intensity is light on both the nose and the palate, um, what should we assess? Again, it's, don't think about it as a, here is a tick box, what is the algorithm for it? It's taking the whole argument um, and, and the whole tasting note holistically. So if it's light, I would imagine that if it's light on the nose and light on the, on the on the palate, there are probably other things that are going on that it's probably a very simple wine. It's probably not very complex. Um, we, I don't know what the acidity and the tannins necessarily might be. So there are other factors there that might sort of be a query of its quality level. So at Diploma, it's not this algorithm of A plus B, therefore, for C. Um, then high alcohol, High alcohol is one of the elements for bottle aging. However, it's remember. It's, so I think this is this was talking about wine number three, which had that high alcohol. Again, here we could have done something despite having high levels of alcohol. You know, it didn't have the necessary fruit concentration uh, for it to age further. However, we could we could also have used that. So it's not that we need to mention absolutely everything. Um, Vicky, one question for you about the Barbera one. I'm um, talking about wine number three. How much do you think it could age in bottle? Um, wine number three, and again, this is something that you could possibly uh, put in your um, in your note to show your understanding um, to an examiner. So perhaps on wine number three, it's not going to be as long aged as. Um, for example, wine number one. So you might, um, I, someone's answering for me, um, you know, you could put in something like, I think this will develop over um, the next sort of, you know, five years um, and then, um, you know, hold for another, you know, three or something like that. So you can show that maybe this wine isn't going to um, last for as long if you think that's um sort of an important um, sort of caveat to maybe uh, put in for the examiner. Again, it's all about, um, ex you know, sort of communicating with the examiner and sort of showing exactly, um, you, you know, your knowledge of these wines. Excellent. Um, thanks, Vicky. And then um, just we're aware of the time here, so I'm just going to skip some questions which we'll answer in, in the other ones. Um, if it's simple aromas, is it common to be good wine or is it more acceptable? Um, again, it's, it's thinking about putting it into perspective. Um, I would say if it's relatively simple, it's not going to be towards the higher end of the, of the quality level. Um, the D3 exam is over two days. Um, and you can find out more information about all of that on the website and exactly how long it lasts. Um, the, the tastings are, it's an hour and a half for, for six wines um, that you do in one day. And then the, the, the theory is split again into to several different parts. Um, what's the step between level three, the jump from two? Yeah, the, <laughs> the jump from level two to level three was, was fairly steep. Um, I think again, three to four, it is, you know, we would expect, as we say, level three, level four um, students to know everything from level um, level three. So, you know, if you if you if you if you're 100 percent of level three, then you're you're ready. But remember, you can pass the level three with um, with just 55 percent. So if you're if you're at 55 percent, you're just a pass, then you might want to think, OK, I need to, to get some more knowledge um, under my belt. Um, and I think we have time for just maybe one or two more questions. Um, maybe Vicky, just quickly, how how do you have any tips on um, finding tannins in terms of in and terms tannins. of yeah, uh, ripe or soft or grippy or all, all of that? Any words um, of wisdom? <laughs> I think um, I mean definitely in diploma, um, I wouldn't get too um, hung up about the exact word we're definitely looking at um you know are these basically are they sort of ripe and soft versus can you sort of feel anything more are they like green um or anything like that 
And to be honest, in the wine world, there are so many people um, using different um, uh, sort of descriptive words for different um, tannins that, you know, someone's uh, grainy might be someone else's sandy or, you know, um, grippy or something like that. So I think, you know, definitely focus on, you know, are these sort of uh, soft versus, um, you know, am I finding them particularly sort of um, apparent um, in another way? Are they particularly sort of uh, drying? Um, and I think it's all about finding the sort of uh, the language that maybe um, works for you. Um, Chris, have you got anything more to say about that in your wine studies? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's that's very much. I mean, one very simple tip with um, tannins is with it polymerizes the saliva will polymerize the tannins. So if you spit it out, you can actually see the number of tannins by looking at how many black little speckles are floating around. But I think yeah, it's, it's kind of concentrating on where where it is um, in in your in your mouth, um, as Vicky said. I'm, I'm aware now that we are at 11 o'clock um, UK time. So unfortunately we couldn't get to everyone's um, responses there. We will send out the answers to these um, questions. Um, sorry, the answers to this in the post email um, follow up, uh, post event follow up. So you will have a copy of all of this. Um, and if you want more information, you can go to, to our website. Um, and thank you very much for joining us um, and we wish you the best of luck and hope to see you at the diploma graduation in a few years. Brilliant. Thanks everyone.